Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another seminar. This uh, forms part of the ongoing series of seminars we've been having on behalf of the Institute of Theory, the um, Institute of the Australian Institute of uh, Physics, and the specifically the Theoretical Physics Group. Uh, I'm David Tilbrook from the Department of Fundamental and Theoretical Physics at ANU, and I'd like to start, as I always do, by acknowledging the people of the Ngunnawal Nation, the traditional custodians of the lands upon which we are located here at ANU, and I think all of Canberra and some of the surrounding New South Wales Territory. And of course, we also acknowledge the uh, traditional custodians of lands all around Australia. We'd like to pay our respects to their leaders, past, present, and emerging. If you're interested in joining the Theoretical Physics Group, you can do that easily by logging into the membership portal on the AIP website, uh, and you'll see the Theoretical Physics group name under the topical groups and uh, you can join there easily. It's free, of course. And in doing so, you know, it's easy to stay informed with significant events that are happening in theoretical physics around Australia. So it's worth doing. Um, over the last couple of years, we've been running these uh, this series of seminars on topics related to fundamental physics, theoretical physics and experimental and observational physics that relate to that, that inform those um, theoretical physics topics and our understanding of physics generally. It's a great, it's been a great series of talks. And if you'd like to watch them or you've seen some and you'd like to go back and watch them again, they're all available to watch on the AIP YouTube channel as this talk will be also. Okay, I, I, I think it's probably true to say that as we all know, quantum mechanics has given rise to a very different perspective on physical reality. Uh, and although it started out, of course, as a model of atomic and molecular physics, we now understand that nature is fundamentally quantum mechanical and that quantum mechanical principles, or at least quantum field, or, or, and, and or including quantum theoretical principles, have to form part of any comprehensive framework for the understanding of nature. But, a cons but constructing a consistent mathematical theory, which is informed by and which um, informs our uh, understanding of nature um, is not easy. It's not an easy task and it's an ongoing task. Some of this extension, if you like, of the original concepts to broader areas of physics, to different macroscopic scales, to different systems, to latest quantum mechanical devices that we are working with, associated with macroscopic quantum, quantum uh, coherence and so forth, probably started reasonably early with the work by um, Einstein, Podolsky and Rosen, for example, the so-called EPR paradox. Um, it was also informed, of course, very much by the work of John Bell, his now famous Bell's inequalities, and by a lot of other thought experiments, the delayed choice experiments, which were both thought experiments and have been done experimentally, of course, such as Wigner's friend and subsequent and other subsequent experiments that have been made possible through the developments in quantum computing uh, experiments and technology, the work that people are doing on qubits and so forth, which in turn was made possible by work pe people such as Anthony Leggett on macroscopic quantum coherence. And I think it's probably true to say that one of the challenges we face when trying to extend uh, quantum mechanics to cover a broad understanding of physical nature is the relationship between the quantum world and our everyday world of macroscopic physics. In particular, how does quantum mechanics give rise to classical physics and should it? By, by, by should it, I mean, does it give rise to our conventional understanding of, of classical physics? Um, or have we simply misunderstood physics at the classical level, despite the fact that it is very successful in explaining the real world? And key to that is to understand what we mean by reality. What do we mean by the real world? So our speaker today, is Margaret Reed from Swinburne University, who is going to address some of these incredibly fascinating issues, as you may have seen if you read her abstract. So Professor Reed is a fellow of the Optical Society of America, the Australian Academy of Science, the American Physical Society and the Australian Institute of Physics. And she's a winner of the 2019 Moyal Medal. So it's a great opportunity and I'm very enthusiastic to have a chance to introduce Margaret with her talk entitled, What's Wrong and Right? with these elements of reality. Over to you, please, Margaret. Okay, thank you so much. So that was a wonderful introduction. <laughs> you must have seen my talk. <laughs> um, exactly, so um, 
Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. It's a great honor. And um, I'd like to begin so by acknowledging my uh, the co-authors on the work that I present today. It's Manashan and Peter. And also to acknowledge uh, Ram, Ria, DC, and Chana, who, who have helped on very closely related um, projects. Um, so yes, my, my talk will primarily concern uh, quantum mechanics versus macroscopic realism. And uh, so trying to understand whether the two can be compatible. And I'll also uh, present a vector causal model for realism, um, which uh, uh, kind of fits in with this theme. Okay. So um, my talk is in three parts. First, I'll present a background. Uh, then I'll discuss the macroscopic realism aspect, and I'll uh, stress the importance of different definitions, because one form of macroscopic realism, I argue, is falsifiable by quantum mechanics, and uh, another, I argue, is consistent with quantum mechanics. Um, and this last part of my talk is uh, work on the, uh, with Peter on the, um, the microscopic model for reality. Um, and the point I'll try to stress here is that this actually supports uh, microscopic realism, despite being microscopic, uh, we to call it a microscopic level. Um, so yes, we'll begin with the EPR paradox, uh, presented in 1935, um, an argument that by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, that quantum mechanics is an incomplete description of physical reality. So um, if you examine their paper, did they present a definition for realism, uh, a sufficient condition for the reality of the physical quantity is a possibility of predicting it with certain certainty without disturbing the system. And uh, linked with that, they then have to uh, um, establish what they mean by not disturbing the system. So there's an uh, introduction of a locality, what we call a locality premise, that a system cannot be stirred by a space-like um, me measurement on another system. Um, so I'll present Bohm's version of the EPR paradox, which um, concerns the Bell state, which is a, a cor anti-correlated um, state of spin half particles two spin half particles, which can be spatially separated. Uh, so for this uh, state, one can calculate that the, all the components of spins are anti-correlated. And what that means is one can measure the spin, any spin component of particle A by a measurement on um, particle B. And then applying the EPR assumptions, which combined we call local realism, then uh, one leads to the conclusion that all of the spin components of particle A are simultaneously predetermined. Described by hidden variables, so lambda z, lambda y for two spin components. Um, and EPR used the term elements of reality to, to describe this predetermination. So as we know, for a local quantum system, there's no uh, local quantum state that would allow simultaneous uh, uh, determination of um, the spin components because they are non-commuting. So, um, right. The next step is the analysis of this Bohm experiment or Gedanken experiment by Bell and uh, because Bell then said, what if you do assume the hidden variables for the spin components, then uh, if you assume the locality as well, then you can write a constraint on the correlations associated with any measurement on those particles. Um, and it is now, this is an example of one, of one Bell inequality, um, the clausel hoyt holt version. Um, and it's well known that this Bell state will violate this inequality for certain choices of uh, spin component, beta and phi. So this um, then creates a mystery, and there's been so much work done since then. Um, as an example, the GHZ version of the test of local realism is a particularly strong falsification of the EPR assumptions, apparently. And uh, so David Merman in this article presented in Physics Today asked what's wrong with these elements of reality. So in particular, he summarizes the EPR reality criterion 
If for that in any way disturbing a system, we can predict with certainty the value of a physical quantity, then there exists an element of physical reality corresponding to this physical quantity. And his comment after that, this element is the predictable value. It ought to exist whether or not we actually carry out the procedure necessary for its prediction, since that procedure in no way disturbs it. And indeed, that's um, very convincing. Um, and um, that's really the issue we'll, we'll try to address or discuss in part in this presentation. So uh, there was a reply by Gore in 1935 to the EPR paradox paper, and it concerned the importance of the measurement settings. So here's a summary of that reply by Clauser and Cimoni. Most of the community of physicists rejected EPR's conclusion, however, because of a reply by Gore, which essentially consists of an analysis of their premise. His argument is that when the phrase without in any way disturbing the system is properly understood, it is incorrect to say that system two, so system A here, is not disturbed by the experimentalist option to measure A rather than A dash on system one. So if we consider the Bohm EPR paradox, the um, two systems are prepared um, at A and at B in a correlated fashion so that, um, say, the experimentalist at A can decide to measure either spin Z or spin Y. Uh, the system, suppose the system is prepared so that the measurement of spin Y can, uh, spin Z can be carried out immediately through some detection, but to measure spin Y, there needs to be a unit, some, some physical device that provides a, a unitary um, transformation, e.g. A, a polarizing beam splitter, to prepare the system for the measurement of spin Y. So the experimentalist here has that option to determine to measure either S0 or SY, and that's called the measurement setting. Similarly, the, uh, the other site, the system B, which is anti-correlated with system A, uh, the experimentalist has that uh, choice to measure either a spin Z or a spin Y, uh, and in that case, there needs to be a, a transformation to prepare the system for the final detection. So what Gore seems to be saying is that the decision here to carry out that unitary transformation or not will disturb the other system in some way. So that the EPR assumption of simultaneous hidden variables prior to those uh, choices is not valid or consistent with quantum mechanics. So in this presentation, I'll be examining the validity of realism after the choice of the measurement settings. Um, there was another reply to the EPR argument in 1935, and this is a famous uh, essay of, by Schrodinger, concerning the cat that's both dead and alive. So Schrodinger argued, well, what if you go further and consider the interaction of the, a microscopic system, say, prepared in a superposition state with a macroscopic meter, um, then after that interaction, the meter does indeed measure the state as we think it should, then the combined system is prepared in this entangled um, correlated state. And Schrodinger essentially raised the issue of macroscopic realism and its consistency with quantum mechanics. So one would expect that with such a macroscopic meter, um, there is macroscopic realism, and then uh, the system is either in, uh, predetermined to give an outcome corresponding to a lot, in this case, alive or dead. So um, the question um, that the question that um, we ask is quantum mechanics consistent with macroscopic realism. So um, typically the consistency is explained through decoherence, but that involves coupling to an environment. So one can ask the question because one can have isolated systems and date states such as this have been created in the laboratories. So you can then ask, is my macroscopic realism valid uh, or a quantum state such as this one? Um, so in this presentation, I'll argue conditions for which one can consider it is valid. Um, and one of the questions I was asked um, by someone who's very knowledgeable in the field is, well, if you see a macroscopic realism for the macroscopic qubit here, then wouldn't it also hold for the microscopic qubit? And then isn't that prevented by the Bell violations? So I'll attempt to 
uh, address this question or investigate this question. So, um, Liga and Garlic. Sure that we can see. Right. Um, so, the, a way to test macroscopic realism was first put forward, I would argue, by in a series by Leggett and Garg in their famous paper. Um, um, they considered a definition for macroscopic realism, um, and they considered first a system that would always have two macroscopically different states available to it. Um, and the definition of macroscopic realism is that the system has to be in one state or the other at any given time independently of any measurement on it. So that means that you can define a macroscopic hidden variable, uh, say minus one, plus one, depending on which state that system is in. Now, it's important to realize first that the term hidden is used only to imply that the value is not explicitly uh, clear in the description of the quantum state. It doesn't mean that the variable can't be measured if it does exist. Um, it's important to realize that the hidden variable only predetermines the outcome of a macroscopically coarse measurement um, that distinguishes a macroscopically distinct state. It doesn't refer to any microscopic details of the state. Um, so with that definition, Leggett and Guy proceeded to try to derive some uh, constraints that one can then test experimentally against uh, quantum mechanics. Now to do that, they had to introduce a second assumption as did Bell. Um, so um, their second assumption is that of non-invasive measurability at a macroscopic level. So um, they considered three times, T1, T2, T3, um, in which the system is in each case considered to be, and has available to it uh, two macroscopically distinct states. So macroscopic realism would put the system at any of those times in one or other of those states. And then the assumption is that one, you can make a measurement that is microscopic, uh, in, uh, microscopically and non-invasive in the sense that the measurement does not um, affect the future macroscopic dynamics of the system. Um, so with those assumptions, you can define a hidden variable uh, at each time, do some algebra, and then arrive at uh, a legate Gargan inequality, which is an inequality um, um, involving two time correlations. Now, that second assumption is very tricky. Um, there have been many. Um, or states shown to violate, quantum states shown to violate these inequalities and a number of experiments. But the tricky aspect is always to justify an in an experiment that second premise. So what I'll look at first in this uh, presentation is replacing that second premise with the premise of a macroscopic locality. So we'll be looking at entangled states uh, by which you can infer the state of one system by a measurement uh, on a spatially separated um, system that is correlated with it. So, um, the first thing we need to do is to find some macroscopic qubits. Essentially, we're discussing here a macroscopic Bell inequality test. Um, so, we need to replace a spin half uh, system with a, a macroscopic spin half system. Um, so we consider a single mode field in two coherent states, which are macroscopically distinct um, for large alpha. So here we take alpha to be real. Um, and uh, as alpha is large, these states are orthogonal and have a mapping onto a spin half system. So we can take the up spin z uh, state to be the alpha and the down to be the minus coherent state. So these states are distinguishable by quadrature phase amplitude, correct phase choice, um, and uh, a value for the macroscopic spin, say minus one and plus one, um, uh, that value can be assigned to the system through this quadrature phase amplitude measurement. Um, we can rotate 
into a different basis um, because using this interaction, which is a, a nonlinear Kerr interaction, n is the number operator, um, after an interaction time t given here, uh, the coherent state becomes a superposition and of the two microscopically distinct states. So it's rotated to be an up state in a different basis. Um, so to perform a macroscopic Bell experiment, you want a mapping from the micro to the macro Gedanken uh, experiments. So that means in addition, you need to uh, have a suitable um, analyzer, which is uh, performs on the macroscopic qubits. So in the Bell, typical Bell experiments, uh, the analyzer might be a, a polarizing beam splitter, and there's a choice of angle, uh, theta and phi, an independent choice at each of the locations. So in the macroscopic version, we replace that uh, analyzer with uh, a nonlinear interaction, um, and the adjustable phases are the adjustable uh, times of interaction of the systems. Uh, the one for each system and the uh, choice of times are independently adjustable. So the interaction we'll uh, specify is the n to the four. And um, indeed, if we look at this analytic solutions with that Hamiltonian, for certain choices of time, uh, we have uh, a two-state system. In other words, macroscopically, uh, a macroscopic superposition created with respect to the qubit values, and uh, it's exactly uh, the rotations that we need to perform a, a, bell a macroscopic bell experiments. So after this time, there's a symmetric cat state form, but after the, at this time, there's an asymmetric uh, superposition. So we also need to actually explain how to derive a macroscopic bell inequality, and that means that you're assuming at this point, and also at this point, that the system is, has available two macroscopically distinct states. So one can apply macroscopic realism and therefore assign hidden variables um, to that system at that time. Um, and this is true for both choices of measurement setting at each site. Um, I can also, one also needs to introduce uh, the macroscopic locality that the value of the hidden variable here is independent of the setting there. Uh, so this is equivalent to the non-invasive measurability assumption of Leggett and Garg. And with that assumption, you go through the derivation straight in a straightforward way um, to um, confirm um, the Bell inequality. So in this case, we're looking at the CHSH Bell inequality. And because of the mapping from the micro to the macro, we immediately know um, what time settings to make to um, obtain the violation of the Bell inequality. So this violation occurs for arbitrary large alpha. And that means that these uh, states that we consider macroscopically distinct are arbitrarily well separated in phase space. And despite that separation, we obtain a maximum violation um, for the Bell inequality. So we can ask, what does this really mean? Um, we falsify that the system um, can be described by deterministic macroscopic realism, that there is a, a predetermined um, hidden variable prior to the choice of the measurement setting. Now, if that's falsifiable, then we like to examine or redefine macroscopic realism uh, in such a way that we can be consistent with quantum mechanics. Um, so we want to weaken the definition so that we can still have a consistency. We want to, to find at what stage can we weaken the definition so there's consistency between macroscopic realism and quantum mechanics. So to do this, we look carefully at the, the measurement. And so this connects with Bohr's reply to the EPR argument. We said there are really two stages of measurement. One is the choice of measurement setting. And the other is the final detections and amplification that come after. So just for simplicity, I'll refer to the last stage as being the pointer stage of the measurement. And the first stage involving the unitary uh, dynamics, the, um, the, the measurement setting stage. So EPR realism essentially, in the Bell version, essentially uh, assumes 
well, essentially we've seen macroscopic realism at this stage with respect to both measurement uh, settings. So we weaken the definition and say there's macroscopic realism at this time with respect to only one, uh, the measurement um, setting that's been um, carried out in the, by the inventory dynamics. So we specify that there's realism with respect to that pointer measurement. So with a subjective, um, we can go back through the definitions of macroscopic realism and also the definition of realism uh, put forth by EPR um, and modify them slightly, weaken them, so they relate only to the point, final point of measurement. So that means going back to our diagram, um, here we're considering the time here after the unitary dynamics associated with the measurement setting choice has been carried out. And we specify macroscopic realism at this point um, so that there's a predetermination of the outcome of the pointer measurement. So in this diagram, experimentalist at A has decided to measure SZ. So there's a predetermination of that outcome uh, at this time. Now, at this location, the experimentalist has decided to measure uh, SY because the unitary dynamics has been performed. So the uh, postulate is that the, there is a predetermination of the outcome for that point of measurement, but not necessarily for the other measurement, which is for which the unitary dynamics has not been performed. Um, so one can also modify the predictive uh, uh, criterion for realism. And if you can here, one can predict, because of the correlation of the initial state, uh, one can in fact predict the outcome of the spin Y measurement at A by a pointer measurement at B. And uh, because this involves a pointer measurement, we argue it's not, uh, um, uh, it, that it's, uh, that prediction is valid. And the unitary dynamics is performed at, at SY, um, there would be a, a prediction, a valid prediction there. So um, the important point is that there's a non-disturbance associated with the um, states uh, created after the measurement setting with respect to the um, pointer, future pointer measurement. So what this means is that there's a, an existence of a, a realism at this time um, for the pointer measurements, but that there's no uh, predetermined outcome for future measurements that involve unitary dynamics associated with the measurement setting. So um, if you have two further sets of unitary dynamics, uh, then there's no predetermination of the measurement outcomes at this time for the, that, that, uh, that, that dynamics. So um, we want to show that that weaker definition of macroscopic realism is consistent with the violation of the bell inequalities and the violation of the fact of the legate Gargan inequality. So to do this, we examine the, um, a macroscopic, um, another uh, macroscopic bell inequality, which is in fact the legate Gargan inequality. So we consider this two mode cat state, and uh, we imagine that we evolve locally, um, dynamically at each site using this interaction, Hamiltonian. And we define the three times of interaction that we looked at earlier. And that ensures that at each of the times, um, there is a macroscopic superposition created at that state and uh, that one can apply macroscopic realism at those times. Because of the correlation, this is really the bone bell state between the two systems, one can in fact measure the spins defined in the ligate Gargan inequality, the spin at this time, that time, and that time for system A by making a measurement system B on system B because of the anti-correlation of the state. Um, so the measurement of spin one uh, can be measured at B non-invasively uh, by not evolving the system at B. You can measure the spin two of system A non-invasively at B by choosing to evolve um, for a time T2 at the site B. So um, this is a non-invasive measurement in the sense of Bell and EPR and Liggett garg So one justifies a Liggett garg inequality. Um, and this is it here, as we had on the screen a few minutes ago. Now we note this actually because we're making this by measurements, it is actually equivalent to a Bell inequality. In fact, this is 
the Bell inequality originally derived by Bell in his original paper. So for this tremor cat state, we violate the inequality by a maximum amount for arbitrary large alpha as the two states become uh, essentially macroscopically distinct in phase space. So how do we interpret this? Um, okay, we can say that, well, macro, macro realism fail, fails. Now, macro realism is a term given to the combined legate gaga premises assumptions. So that involves macroscopic realism and also the non-invasive mutability assumption. Um, in this Duncan experiment, we're actually assuming we, the weaker version of macroscopic realism because we assume we've appeared for the pointer basis at each of these times. So I guess I'm, what I'm arguing here is that one can argue that this part of the assumption is actually valid and the um, violation occurs because of the failure of uh, the second assumption, in other words, failure of the locality. And this is uh, explained because the violations can be shown to be due to a situation where there is two further unitary rotations um, required. Um, so let's just look at that. We can examine carefully the dynamics associated with the violation of the legate gag inequality. And it's the moment here that is crucial because the other two moments are identical, and the predictions are identical as for the non entangled state, which does not give a violation. So if you examine carefully the S2, S3 moment, and we look at the dynamics associated with those measurements, um, so we evolve system A for a time T3 and system B for a time T2, thereby measuring S3 and S2. Here is a depiction of the dynamics through each of those times, T2, T3, and then the time after the second set of dynamics at B. And that, at that final time, there's a measurement of S3 and S2, giving this correlation. This is a dynamics for the, um, the CAT state. Now, we can apply weak macroscopic realism at each time, and we can validate two hidden variables for each time because there are two pointer measurements for a bipartite system. However, we note that we can't validate three uh, hidden variables. So what is happening here is that there's an inconsistency between the, um, the lambda one, the lambda two, and the lambda three. They're not consistent. Uh, so by this, we mean that if you did actually make a measurement at this time, um, to record the value for lambda one and lambda two, um, you would um, then create a mixture, a mixed state at that point. And one can compare the dynamics of that mixed state with the dynamics of the cat state if you did not make the measurement. And what you notice is that the dynamics is indistinguishable initially and also after the first rotation. But then after the second rotation, there is a macroscopic distinction. And it's this macroscopic distinction that allows the violation of the legate guard bell inequality. So um, also what is interesting and important um, is that um, the, at the time here, there was no distinguishable difference between the predictions of the cat state and the mid state. Here, alpha is in, becoming infinite. So uh, the distinction, for example, between those states and Q function is bench average terms, which vanish with large alpha. So there's a measurable difference, indistinguishable difference between the dynamics. But after the two unitary rotations, there's a macroscopic difference. And that seems counterintuitive, uh, but it's an illustration of the breakdown of the second premise uh, of legate Garg, that what appears to be a microscopic uh, non-invasive measurement uh, can nonetheless alter the dynamic, future dynamics macroscopically. Um, we mentioned the idea that the weak macroscopic realism enables specification of a hidden variable at a given time, and that is not affected by any future dynamics. So that brings to mind the delayed choice experiments of Wheeler, uh, which seem to suggest a, a retrocausality. And you then ask, can you, in fact, uh, create a macroscopic cat version of such an experiment? So uh, yes, you can, and this has um, been shown and managed with by Manishan and his thesis. 
um, and I won't go into all the details because I'll run out of time. But um, what this means, firstly, the actual the original Wheeler experiment can be interpreted causally, but a modification of that experiment allows exclusion or falsification of all two-dimensional non-metricausal models. So we're doing the macroscopic version. What we're excluding are all um, two-dimensional non-metricausal, not, um, we're excluding um, two-dimensional um, uh, non-metricausal models with macroscopic qubits. Now, we want to argue weak macroscopic realism asserts macroscopic, uh, there's no macroscopic metricausality. So what that tells us is that the extra dimensions that are present in the cat state system are important for maintaining consistency of macroscopic realism with these, paradox, these paradoxes. And uh, that's consistent with what we saw in the earlier slide, that if you compare the predictions of the cat state with a mixed state, which does not give these paradox, paradoxical effects, although there's no distinguishable difference at the qubit level, after the feature dynamics, there is a microscopic difference. So it's the extra dimensions that are important um, here. Before going on to the last part of the talk, um, I'd like to present an argument against microscopic realism. Um, and that relates, of course, to Schrodinger's paradox. You could argue this way. Well, if you assume, if you just look at the cat state, if you assume that the system is embedded in one or other of these states, then there's a restriction on the variance of x. Um, and if the system is in a quantum state, then that puts a, a constraint on the minimum value for the variance of p because of the uncertainty relation. And therefore, if the system's in one state or the other, that's the mixed, mixed state, and therefore you get a fundamental lower bound on the variance of p for the overall state. And uh, if you evaluate the variance of p for the superposition, the cat state, in fact, that uh, variance violates that bound. So it's as though if you do allow macroscopic realism, it's as though the states that the system is in cannot be quantum states. So that seems to argue against, uh, well, then you'd argue an incompleteness of quantum mechanics. So that seems to be against the hypothesis of uh, validity of macroscopic realism. So I now go to the last part of the talk, which is the work with Peter. And I'll present a model for reality based on the Q function. And essentially, um, this model, I'll argue this model, how this illustrates how one can be consistent, how quantum mechanics can be consistent with macroscopic realism. Um, now, we'll look at a single mode field and consider a system appeared in a superposition of two eigenstates of x, the x quadrature. And we'll consider a very simple example, a model for a measurement on that system. This is direct amplification. So one can directly amplify the x quadrature via a parametric Hamiltonian. And very simple solutions to, uh, give uh, the operator solutions for positive g, there is amplification of x, and that corresponds to a de-amplification of the complementary um, p uh, observable. So we're looking at a phase space anal analysis of this, and we'll look at the q function for the single mode defined this way. And it's always positive, it uniquely defines the quantum state. What we notice is that the q function for the eigenstate x, uh, although it does in fact have noise associated with it, that's despite the fact that the final noise in the variance is zero, this is an eigenstate. And that's an interesting feature of the Q function. But I'll just refer to this as, um, for simplicity, the background vacuum noise. It's not the vacuum noise associated with the minimum uncertainty state. It exists to describe the eigenstate. So, um, One can take the Fokker Planck equation for the Q function and solve it uh, with respect to this interaction, the amplification, which is modeling the measurement. One would like to analyze the uh, solutions for x and p and derive stochastic equations for those variables, which are classical like variables. Um, and this is difficult because of the, uh, the noise term here, which becomes negative. 
what is very nice though is that this is this and decouples um, the x equation decouples from the p equation, which is very, very nice. These are noise correlations, but mathematically, and I refer to the papers here with Peter, um, one can nonetheless solve uh, mathematically by doing a retrocausal solution or, or simulation. So, um, We have two equations, one for the amplified or measured variable and one for the complementary variable. These are solved stochastically, this is solved retrocausally, and this is solved um, in the forward direction. So these are backward forward stochastic equations. I refer to the solutions as trajectories because they're stochastic solutions. Um, the sol method of solution. Um, to solve the Q function initially for the initial state. Um, one can solve the Q function for the, uh, so we've seen the initial state as a superposition of X eigenstates. We take the X uh, basis, X representation. So um, then we can solve for the Q function at the later time. And what is interesting is that the initial distribution will be Gauss, will involve Gaussians, the means being the eigenvalues. And then there's these background noise terms, vacuum noise terms. Uh, there's, back, there's background, background vacuum noise, so you have the Gaussian. Um, after the amplification, the Q function is a sum of Gaussians. The means are amplified, so the eigenvalue is amplified, but the noise, the background noise is not amplified. So um, here's an example of the solutions, the classic solutions for the eigenstates initially in an X eigenstate. So these are the, this is the backward propagation, this is the forward propagation, this is the amplification, the measurement. So the eigenvalue amplifies to, uh, this is the amplified eigenvalue that is measured. The noise, this background noise is not amplified, it's just constant through, through the simulation. And um, you get, but for the complementary variable, which is not measured because we're amplifying along the x direction, these uh, decay but to the vacuum noise level only. Um, so one can then look at solutions for the uh, a superposition state. So let's take a macroscopic superposition where the eigenstates are separated by a large amount relative to vacuum noise level. Here's an example, here's a simulations. So um, here's, there are two sets of trajectories um, associated with each eigenstate. And the corresponding deamplified four trajectories for the non-measured observable, uh, the non-measured quantity. So you don't get to fringe terms here. What is interesting is that these backward trajectories are the same as if the system were in a mixture of the two eigenstates. And that's because of the way that the, um, uh, the amplification process works, that it picks out the, eigen, the Gaussians associated with the eigenvalue uh, solutions at the initial time, and everything else decays away. So these backward propagating trajectories are identical for the mixture as for the superposition, but the P forward propagating uh, trajectories are not. Um, so that's interesting. Um, now we can look at a more microscopic superposition where the two eigenstates are closer together. And uh, this is what we get. Um, note that the measurement, uh, the amplification means that you still get a precise outcome, either lamb x1 or minus x1, the two eigenvalues associated with with the superposition. Uh, so that you measure the eigenvalues. Um, that's despite the fact there's an overlap at the beginning, there's still this probabilistic interpretation because it's, these trajectories are identical for the mixture, uh, for which there's a probabilistic interpretation. The trajectories for P, however, are, are different between the superposition and mixture. Um, so what we need to do um, is check the solutions by taking a point in time through the measurement amplification and checking that the densities 
um, the, the X and P's corresponding date to the Q function at that time. So I can evaluate the Q function through the, um, the normal quantum mechanics. Um, what is interesting is that there's, although the trajectories for X and P are independent, um, they solved. At the boundary here, there is a connection because of the conditional uh, 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 associated with the um, Q function. So that certain trajectories for X are linked with certain trajectories for P. Simulation that goes to this point, um, but then there is a link for given trajectories in X with given trajectories in P. Um, for a superposition, there is that correlation and link. What is interesting is for a mixture, there's a complete decoupling. Um, what is also interesting is that one can therefore take a final outcome uh, corresponding to one of the eigenvalues and establish the connected trajectories in P through this conditional distribution. Um, one might ask, how can you get consistency with the Q function at a given time, which is a causal, uh, because the, the T here is from uh, T naught to T, that is a causal evolution. How can that be consistent with the fact that you have a future boundary condition, an arbitrary time in the future? And so one way to look at it is to think of the causal relations involved in the simulation. So the I, an eigenvalue goes to an amplified eigenvalue, um, and that can be seen as a forward relation. But what is interesting is that the, the simulation starts here, um, and the noise is introduced, but the vacuum, the, the, the background vacuum noise is constant. So the noise variance is constant and dependent of the time here. So that evolves backwards, and this can be viewed as an unobservable hidden uh, trajectory because the actual x value incorporating that deviation is not measurable. Only the mean or the eigenvalue is measured. Um, and then there's a connection to the P for superpositions and then a forward going. Um, now this trajectory this is not, doesn't correspond to a measurable quantity because that's a deamplified um, variable. Um, so there's a kind of a, a loop, a hidden loop um, in this model. We can examine consistency for Born's rule by taking a very long time of amplification. And there, um, the background vacuum noise sort of vanishes from the solutions and you get um, only really the effect of the, um, what the original eigenvalues were. So, there's, so one can look at this final solution and um, scale the variable back to account for the amplification. And indeed, you get the exact um, solution given by quantum mechanics for Born's rule. So one can also consider the measurement for P um, by changing the sign here of G. And uh, for the cat state here, you get fringes. And the density of the distributions here um, exactly coincide with the predicted fringes according to the normal calculation of quantum mechanics for that state. So this brings to mind an interpretation for reality um, because there's a, one can interpret that there's a probability the system is in a, a given, with a given amplitude and that connects with this final measurement. Um, and um, so at least for large DT that there is a a realism associated with this, um, this model. And then we're back to the question of um, weak macroscopic realism. So looking at a macroscopic superposition, is there a reality associated with that? So we argue from this model that there, might, that there is, because we have a one-to-one -one correspondence here with the final outcome with the initial amplitudes or band of amplitudes for the state. Um, so um, one can postulate that the um, final outcome for the measurement is indeed predetermined um, by these amplitude values. Um, so, but then that brings to mind the um, paradox we mentioned earlier regarding the Schrodinger cat. Um, so if you do condition 
your trajectories on the final outcome for um, X being positive, say, so you're, you're measuring, you've measured this state, that the system is in this state, then you can use a conditional um, result at the boundary to establish the connected trajectories for P. And then you can work out the uh, final measured variances associated with those coupled trajectories. And indeed, the uncertainty product, delta P delta X, is below that uh, associated with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Um, so here one gets the, uh, this sort of validates the paradox we mentioned earlier, um, um, that if you assume uh, 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 macroscopic realism seems to be a, a kind of a, an inconsistency with the states you, you'd arrive at. We notice, however, that the very, very um, quick increase in size of the superposition, as x1 here increases, the product does quickly become one, approaches one. So that then gives a, a model for understanding the quantum to classical transition. This is again Schrodinger's paradox, um, because as you amplify the system, even if it begins at a macro microscopic superposition, um, after amplification, after some time, you, it's a macroscopic superposition. And at some point, you can argue this um, reality description. So we note, though, that the, uh, the system here, with this, uh, measured by this Hamiltonian, is reversible. So that motivates modeling um, a coupling to a meter. And now we're going back to the uh, paradox, uh, showing a paradox picture. Um, where Schrodinger said when you couple a system to a meter, you end up with a state like this. So in this case, we imagine that that's happened and our system A, which was originally a cat state, is now in this entangled state, the meter. And the meter can be identified as either a coherent state here or coherent state there, and that's correlated with the state of the system, so it thereby gives a measurement of it. So with beta large, this is a direct analogy with that uh, earlier state we had on the slide. And the question is, can we identify a reality um, for this state? So using this trajectory model, one can perform the measurements um, on the meter and also on the system directly and look at what happens. So here we assume beta and alpha to be real. So we're making X quadrature measurements. Um, so here are the pictures of the trajectories. There's a bigger uh, noise at the end there because there's a coherent state, and there's a, a vacuum noise, additional vacuum noise associated with the coherent state. So what you notice is, yes, um, you can assign a, using the model I've explained, you can assign a reality to this meter, uh, that it's actually in a state with a predetermined outcome. Um, for the um, final measurement um, at this time, what you can evaluate then is the conditional inferred state for the system based on those trajectories using the conditional um, uh, method I explained earlier. Um, and when you integrate over the meta variables, particularly the PB, then um, you do it obtain exactly the, the, the Q function. Uh, when you look at the, the, the densities for the uh, system A, the P and X densities, you obtain the Q function associated with the coherent state. So one can argue that there is a reality also for the microscopic system in the sense that this can be conditioned um, uh, at the time here, at the time of creation of the state um, by conditioning on the, the meta. Um, variables. Um, it's not in, this is not in contradiction with the um, violation of Bell inequality, because I'd argue, because what we've seen from the earlier slides, here there's a determination that the measurement setting has been determined already in the evolution to, of this state. So we've seen that where you have a, a, a measurement, the measurement setting determined, um, you can define a realism which is not inconsistent with the violation of a bell inequality. So now I come to the last part of the talk, looking at the EPR paradox. So one can also examine um, this model um, uh, using a, a 
you can examine EPR correlations using this model. So we'll take the two most squeeze state, which for large uh, squeezing R will indeed give a simultaneous eigenstate of X difference in P sum, and this is the original EPR paradox um, presented in 1935, continuous variable version. So we can also model uh, the system because we can amplify the X and amplify the P using um, this Hamiltonian. And the solutions, is a lot of work done by Peter. Um, the trajectories here for the XA and the XB, if one chooses to measure X at each side, um, you do, do indeed see that the, this is the solution here uh, for those trajectories, um, agrees with the quantum prediction um, and the limit of large amplification, uh, as you expect. Um, because um, yeah, because the vacuum, the background vacuum noise just sort of vanishes relative to the amplified uh, mean value, which is the, uh, the measured quantity. So for large DT, these uh, trajectories, the associated trajectories between XA and XB are correlated. So you see this here. The trajectories that are associated uh, between the two systems are given with the portrayed with the same color. So this indeed gives uh, a local description for um, the EPI correlations. Um, and you know, one can argue consistency then with macroscopic realism because using the same model as before, as you increase the amplitude of the amplification, you have your essentially a superposition of macroscopically distinct states and you can identify a, a, a reality at this point, which is associated with it. Um, a predetermined final outcome. So um, also interesting is that one can measure X and P, so X and A and P at B, and um, uh, check the, uh, the assumptions made uh, and the definition for the, um, for the microscopic realism that they're consistent um, with this model. And indeed they are. Um, so what is interesting is one can actually predict through this trajectory for P, the outcome um, of X, sorry, of P at A, but that uh, prediction is associated with the further unitary dynamics at that site. So, um, question then are these EPR elements of reality? No, because the EPR elements of reality were concerned with uh, predetermination prior to the choice of measurement setting. And here we have looking at elements of reality after the choice of the measurement setting, because here we have chosen to either amplify X or P. So um, on the other hand, um, there is a, 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 a reality and a, a locality. So the final question and the final slide I present is, would you be able to examine the bell violations through this model? So yes, one could, and what insight would you get from that? Um, so bell violations are possible with quadrature phase amplitude measurements, um, but you need to rotate uh, the measurements to have a theta and a phi at each location. And the violation requires, is consistent with what we've seen before, the unitary rotation relative to the initial preparation at both sides. Um, so um, there are two interesting features that you would observe. Because of the non-zero rotation here, um, that is modified, in this case, we modify, modify a phase shift, which is a simple forward going trajectory. But once that mix the X's and the P's, so that creates, in the original basis, a more complex looking um, loop, hidden loop. Um, the other interesting feature is that, in fact, when you look at the, the way that the, despite the fact that the phase shifts and these trajectories are local, when you look at the Q function and the way that that transforms after the rotations, the, as we've seen so earlier, um, the non-observable features of the Q function that exist for the entangled state become observable features after the unitary dynamics. Um, uh, and that, Leads to a, uh, what seems to be what leads to a breakdown in this Bell assumption, in other words, to the, the breakdown of this locality assumption. So, 
I have a set of conclusions. Um, I've probably said enough, so um, perhaps I'll just leave those conclusions up there on the slide. And, uh, thank you for listening. Thanks very much, Margaret. That was really, really interesting. There's a lot of material there, and I'm looking forward to looking at the YouTube video um, to see if I can um, understand a bit, a little bit more of the talk. There's a couple of uh, questions in the Q&A panel from Michael Hall. Um, just before we get to his questions, <clears throat> we covered this to some extent later in the talk, but in the early part of the talk, well, once you got to your definition of weak macroscopic realism, I kept wondering, um, what are the hidden assumptions, if any, about when we define these elements of reality and they're associated with, um, um, uh, uh, with um, space-like separations? Are there any hidden assumptions that we need to be aware of in relation to the fact that, they, that, that, that there are local time measurements involved in these assumptions, in, in this definition of weak macroscopic realism? Do you, do you understand what I'm asking? Okay, um, probably, probably don't. <laughs> I guess what we say is, um, so um, um, <clears throat> first, the, the standard, um, explanation in terms of the bell and EPR is that there's space like separated measurements of the times that are performed on a scale that there could be no causal connection. Oh yes, of course. But, but, I mean yeah, on, yeah. on your on your slide 48, for example, which I think was the EPR slide, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Right. So yeah. um yeah, so we would assume the same here, but that there's a there can be an arbitrary large separation right. between the systems A and B. Um, yeah. So, that, that so, so then what happens if we delay uh, the measurements, say, on A, long after the measurement of B? Does that have any implication no. for the yeah. definition of weak macroscopic realism? No. So the idea uh, is that this is, there's a lot of tricky stuff in here, and that's why, um, or thought questions, and that's why uh, we actually looked at the delayed choice experiments of Wheeler and, 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 and uh, yeah. recently, yeah. because... Uh, yeah. You have to be, yeah. but no, uh, um, the the time, uh, the local interactions here, it's relative to a local time clock, and you can delay. In fact, um, in one of the slides, we did actually, I did actually choose to, um, where is it? Um, <clears throat> and this experiment here, oh, no, um, I think my internet is too slow. <laughs> <laughs> Just, we okay, are being sorry. Um, by the technology. I, I just I, okay, great. Oh, there we go. All right. <laughs> okay, so in this experiment, we actually, with uh, Manish, I'm actually um, delayed the choice. De de oh. de decided to delay de deliberately yes. delay the um, the choice of measurement right. made at B because that infers the measurement or the result of this has been at the earlier time, and but that can be delayed as long as we like, and then. As long as um, there's no change in the predictions, um, you can still explain the violations um, uh, because they occur where you have um, uh, two further unitary transformations and there's a time scale. Your time, uh, unitary dynamics, there's dynamics happening there, yeah. which allows, uh, it's not a sudden change going from, uh, it, it, there's, a, there's a dynamics that they Yes. Uh, somehow it, it evolves into this paradoxical situation. Um, but you can, it doesn't, the relative, um, you can consider this experiment, or you consider the experiment in which this is, that is measured after that, but it doesn't make no difference. Oh, um, that, that's interesting. Yeah. I didn't yeah. pick up on that when I first, when yeah. I first saw yeah. this idea. That's first yeah. time. It makes no difference where these, these are local interactions, it makes no difference where you. Um, oh. So, so um, there are delayed choice paradoxes in here, but um, they can be when you go through carefully, they can be explained consistently with this definition because the definition um, specifies at each time a result for a point, a predetermination point of measurement. So I see. Um, depending on which way you do it, you then become inconsistent with the previous. Uh, uh, there's an inconsistency arising with the previous um, hidden variable in the sense that, yeah, as I 
illustrated with the, if you did make a measurement of that and recorded that, you would get yeah, different it. dynamic, future dynamics. It's, yeah. um, that's exactly an interesting question, which is why we looked at the delay choice. Ah, right. Okay. That's fascinating. Well, you can probably read uh, Michael Hall's questions, but for the benefit of people watching the YouTube video later, they won't be able to see them. So I'll just read them out. So Michael Hall's first question is, if a measurement results in a mixture of two Gaussians in the future, in your retrocausal example, starting from a superposition in the past, then the evolution is non-unitary. But uh, you are claiming to model a unitary evolution. Does the non-unitarity arise because of some sort of pre or post selection to a sub to a sub ensemble or because of something retrocausal that is different from standard quantum mechanics. Okay, so um, let me just try to understand. Okay, so um, okay, so, um, so these simulations um, are done. Um, Okay, so um, the in this instance, the um, uh, solution for the x, the equation of the x in the PT couple. So one begins uh, solving x, um, and because of the decoupling, um, you are required to you require the margin of the x. And that, when you look at the, um, uh, for this particular model and for the superpositions, um, that is a, that becomes a, um, a, a set of Gaussian, a Gaussian, uh, yeah, a set of Gaussians um, in the large amplification. Yeah, right. yeah. So um, uh, then you can, um, but you solve backward. Um, and um, then connect. So, um, yeah. Um, now I'm not sure exactly what the what the question was that um, um, Michael was asking. So, apart from that, so um, 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 so he's he's claiming that um, if the measurement results in a mixture of two Gaussians in the future. In your retrocausal example, you've just been discussing. Oh, okay. Well, if that um, starts from a superposition in the past, then this okay. implies non-unitary uh, evolution. Okay, I, I think it's, it's a bit tricky. Um, to okay, so we're not saying that the okay, we're not saying that the final solution in the future is Gaussian. Um, the final solution is given here, and, and we evaluate the. I mentioned Peter's done a lot of hard work here. Uh, Peter has done these um, verifications, but we. Um, validate the Q function um, in, at a given time uh, using the both trajectories, X and P. But to solve, um, because the X, so it doesn't, we're not assuming uh, the Gaussians, the, the, the total function is a Gauss, um, sum of Gaussians. It's just that um, to solve the X trajectory because of the decoupling, um, between x and p, you can solve that mathematically by taking a uh, region just to get the margin of the x, and then um, uh, the, 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 the trajectory for p does require the um, you know the other aspect uh, of the uh, of the q function um, that the superposition aspects come into that at this point and change, and that the, the trajectory for p illustrates that. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, so, um, so there's this one, and then there's that one going forward. So to begin with this one, you just got the marginal of the future Q, but, that, that, but the Q functions at any given time, the total Q, fun full Q function, incorporates um, uh, solution for the X and the P, and, and that's not a sum of gap, that's more complex. But it's incorporated consistent with this uh, these solutions which are called going. Right. <laughs> and then Michael went on to say that <clears throat> if you amplify all the quadratures equally, the, re the retro causal model uh, retro causal model will allow me to measure them all at once. I they all become real. It seems reasonable if the process somehow adds additional noise in comparison to the 
single quadrature amplification? Is there okay. an easy way to see where such additional noise might come from? Okay, so I'd have to think carefully about Michael's question. <laughs> so here we look, we're only amplifying one uh, quadrature, either X or P at a time. Um, so, um, okay, so here's an example where we amplify P. Uh, to get the final uh, measurement, model the final measurement of the cat state, uh, the P of the cat state. Um, so we've only looked, and of course we could model, um, we could amplify any combination, but we only, uh, if you amplify, um, so here, this is a, a, a quantum um, interaction. Uh, we were amplifying uh, one, um, we're measuring one observable, considering measuring one observable, fixed observable, and it's modeled by this quantum interaction. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, if you uh, if you measure, uh, if you try to do uh, perform a model where you somehow make a simultaneous measurement um, of an X and a P, then there would be additional noise coming in, um, but uh, there would be additional vacuum noise. Um, so here, for example, there's vacuum noise associated with the precarious state, and that comes out correctly in the analysis because it's based on the correct Q function at the initial time. So I think it would all work out, but I um, have to look at that question more carefully. Yeah. And then uh, weak macroscopic realism, is it, is, it, is it effectively assuming that the choice of setting is irreversible? Yeah, and that's a really good question. Yeah, mm. um, no, because so I looked at that. Um, so um, you can consider the time after the choice of measurement setting, and apply those definitions at that time, irrespective of whether this final measurements have been carried out. Um, right. uh, and that, as I said, I think that. This, I could apply or I've put through the, sort of, uh, some the previous work of a lot of people uh, motivated by that previous work, um, including Ball. Um, but that, that is a kind of realistic uh, interpretation at that time. But then if you change the measurement setting, you, in fact, in this example where you measure, um, you can infer P um, at A by measuring B. But to realize that prediction, you would need to actually reduce um, uh, the measurement preparation here, which is for X, by de amplifying and then continue to amplify P. But you would realize that prediction. Um, uh, yeah. So, but then you're looking at a definition, then you would, it's a little bit like the. Um, Here, I considered uh, applying with macroscopic realism at each time. So as you change the measurement settings, and this can be reversible, you can go back and forth between the measurement settings. Um, you can specify according how the system is prepared for the point of measurement, um, the hidden variables that, ex that exist at that time. So there's a sequence of times in which you can specify. Yeah. Um, it does mean that there can be a consistency between like the past setting, let's say a uh, spin one at that time, it's not necessarily consistent with the future um, uh, predetermination um, at a later time for that same spin measurement because it can be unitary dynamics happening at both sites. Yeah, so but at any given time, I argue that the uh, system is specified with respect to the point of measurement at each location. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, that's really, really interesting. Um, oh, was there another question? Michael's got lots of questions here. Oh. There was one other question about, but perhaps, oh, not, oh, did I miss one? I'm sorry, Michael, did I miss a question of yours? Um, the one about the Q, I think Michael might be referring to his question. Sorry, I missed that. He's referring to the Q function approach. I wonder if the Q function approach can cover cases where there doesn't seem to be amplification. Is referring to Renninger's paradox example a particle is emitted in a superposition of left and right travel 
place a left detector close to the source, then if the detector doesn't go ping in a short time, we know the particle travel to the right without having to amplify anything. Yeah. Well, that's, um, that's so there's a lot of um, uh, work to be done. Um, yeah. Um, so, um, so far, so um, uh, I have to give credit to Peter, he has done a lot of this work, um, but so far, um, the amplification models work really well. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot of insight. Actually. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, I, it's beautiful yeah. the way you can look at the um, evolution in those amplification models. Yes, yes. I think that I think that reveals a lot. Yes. Um, and particularly the the um, inconsistency or paradox between the completeness. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. But, um, the next step uh, is to look at a spin measurement, and uh, yes. so like a model of spin belt experiment. Yeah. That's what we got, and and. Um, there are models for that measurement, um, Hamiltonian models, which couple the spin to a C value system, uh, like a, a coherent state. Yeah. So then we could aim to uh, look at the Q dynamics for that model yeah. and then do the final amplification via the parametric amplification that we've done here. But um, you know, it's all the hard work. Yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> uh, if, yep. if we didn't have something to do, we would be bored, right? <laughs> Thanks very much, Marco. That was a terrific talk. Um, I remind everyone if you'd like to see it again, I certainly be watching it again. It'll be on the YouTube channel within a few days. Um, thank you once again very much, Marco. Thank you everyone for attending, and we will let you know when the next talk is due. Thank you. Thanks, very everyone. Much. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.